On May the 8th, 2006, Sony embarrassed themselves in front of the gaming world. That's how Matt Cox began his cheeky edit of Sony's E3 press conference, one of the first gaming videos to go viral on YouTube. This was the video that turned moments into memes. Here's this giant enemy crab. Ridge Racer! Remember that one? Attack its weak point for massive damage. <clears throat> Other keynotes have faded, but Sony's presentation is still seared into people's memories, for all the wrong reasons. But most of the context of this event has been forgotten. We might recall the reaction, Sony becoming a laughingstock online, but how well do we remember the substance? The titles that were announced, the features that were demoed, and the circumstances that led Sony to lose a huge market lead. Today, with hindsight, we're going to take a fresh look at this presentation. How did Sony end up in this situation? And how did they get out of it? Was the criticism excessive or deserved? Was this embarrassing keynote really that bad? Sony, you went wrong with your PS3. I'll just keep playing my 360. Hope this song has helped you understand. Now you know how you killed your brand. This is Retro History's Keynote Revote. The PlayStation 2 had been a roaring success for Sony, selling more than any console in history. Three times more PS2s were sold in its lifetime than Xboxes and GameCubes combined. Entering the high-def era, Sony's position seemed unassailable. They'd announced the PlayStation 3 a year earlier, and made confident claims of its capabilities. The development of Cell is for uses beyond games. Its supercomputer attributes will revolutionize computer technology. But the original release date had been and gone, and the opposition wasn't biding its time. Nintendo had spent two years teasing the revolution and its motion controller, and the Xbox 360 had already been on the shelves for half a year. Sony knew that right after their presentation, Microsoft would be announcing their second wave of games. So when Cars Hirai said, We have said on many occasions that the next generation doesn't start until we say it does. The bluster was obvious. Sony knew that the competition had started without them, and that they had some catching up to do. Now the pressure was on to demonstrate how the supercomputer in console form they'd boasted about would translate to superior gameplay, to make the case that the PS3 was worth waiting for. So here was Sony's message for E3 2006. PlayStation 3 is powered by Cell. It's a processor with power rivaling that of supercomputers. PlayStation utilizes Blu-ray. PlayStation 3 will support true high-definition output at 1080p resolution, hard disk drive built right into the box. Online and networking for the PlayStation 3 is as essential as the air that we breathe. PlayStation 3 is the most advanced computer entertainment system in the world. PlayStation 3 is real the future becomes reality. Okay, I have no idea what that one meant. Watching through today's eyes, this section has all the surprise and wonder of a deputy area manager's PowerPoint presentation. Besides a couple of minutes of PSP trailers, the first 25 minutes of the keynote was a literal slideshow, with patter like, it truly takes advantage of the consumer lifestyle trends, and it's about the ability to offer the right product strategy at the right time. It's fair to say that the audience didn't exactly lap this up. But that raises a question. At whom was this presentation aimed? E3 has come a long way from its origins. The glitz and spectacle of the event are now aimed at the game-buying public watching at home. But 20 years ago, there was no point in blowing the budget on a big show. Keynotes wouldn't be seen by people outside of the room. In the 90s, few gamers could download a two-hour video and the bandwidth to serve live streams was years away. So E3 presentations could be dry affairs. During Nintendo's first keynote in 1995, Howard Lincoln spent 25 minutes talking about piracy and counterfeiting. It's not that these early conferences were bad, they were just aimed at a different audience. But by the mid-2000s, things were changing. Gaming news sites, as well as TV stations like G4, were now delivering video to a large audience and E3 was rapidly turning into a consumer-first event. I think that's why things were a little strange in 2006. Sony weren't just addressing the people in the room, 
They made this keynote available for download, but they were stuck in an old mindset, talking more to industry insiders than the consumers who now made up the majority of the audience. Or, as Giant Bomb's Brad Shoemaker put it, this is like the World War I of video game press conferences. Like yeah. the, 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 technology, warfare, the technology had surpassed the tactics and they hadn't caught yeah. up yet. <laughs> the previous year, Sony had displayed a prototype PS3 controller alongside the console. They never referred to it, but it quickly became known as the Boomerang. But the final design that Ken Kutaragi pulled from his pocket bore no resemblance to the Boomerang. Instead, the 6 axis looked practically identical to the previous generation's DualShock, causing an agonizingly awkward moment as the audience tried to figure out if the announcement was a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final PlayStation 3 controller. <laughs> Oof. The superficially similar shell held some fresh secrets. They'd added six degrees of motion control and removed the rumble that had been present in its predecessors. Sony told the press that this was a technical limitation, but the bigger obstacle was a legal battle over the DualShock's force feedback. Sony attempted to spin the situation, saying rumble was a last generation feature and explaining that developers would find innovative uses for motion, like detecting the player's emotional state. But the following year, Following the settlement of the case, the DualShock 3 was released, and the 6-axis was quietly discontinued. Its motion features never lived up to their advertised potential. And the boomerang? That was just a mock-up. But according to its designer, Taiyu Goto, it was a direction they were seriously looking at, the one that proved a little too eccentric. A demo was shown of integration between the PS3 and PSP, where the small screen of the handheld served as a live rear-view mirror for an F1 car being driven on the console. Though a bit of a gimmick, the demo was framed as a broader promise. And on the game development side, we're aggressively seeking out ways to connect the two products in unique and interesting ways. Foreshadowing what Nintendo would do with the Wii U five years later. But they never delivered on that promise. In the end, neither Formula One nor any other game supported the PSP as a secondary device. It wasn't until the release of the Vita that it was possible, and even then, it was supported by only a handful of titles. Throughout the keynote, the elephant in the room was never mentioned, but the subtext was clear. Our device is better. But it was one thing to say it, proving it would be harder. The only way to do that would be with state-of-the-art games. Phil Harrison introduced many of Sony's first-party titles, Larry Probst was on stage to show off EA's virtual sports stars, and a handful of other games were unveiled by their creators, such as Kazunori Yamauchi demoing Gran Turismo HD in the longest time slot in the entire show, 15 minutes that felt even longer. The pacing here was peculiar. Nearly five minutes on Resistance Fall of Man, three and a half on SingStar, with no singing, and the notorious Genji 2 demo. I haven't played this game, I expect most people haven't, but it looks pretty mediocre. But instead of showing a trailer, for some reason they spent four and a half minutes of stage time on this game. It's no wonder producer Bill Rich's demo felt padded. He had more time to fill than material with which to fill it. These timing decisions were just odd, and this made the whole thing feel worse than the sum of its parts. Because many of the games that were shown here were actually pretty good. Warhawk, Resistance Fall of Man, Loco Roco on the PSP, the first trailer for Assassin's Creed, Metal Gear Solid 4, and the first glimpse of a still untitled Uncharted. Not every one of these is a classic, but they were all rated highly on release. In fact, if you take the Metacritic average of all the games Sony showed, not counting re-releases or the four that were cancelled, and do the same thing for Nintendo's show, where they revealed new Super Mario Bros., Metroid Prime 3, and Super Mario Galaxy, well, you'll find you've spent half a day making a minor point, but you'll also find that Sony's presentation had a slight edge. There were some less than remarkable games in the Sony lineup, for sure. Genji 2, Lair, Sonic 06, the Gundam launch title. The catalogue wasn't outstanding, but it was good. But Sony didn't need good games, they needed the best. They claimed a supercomputer, capable of extraordinary visual grandeur, but their presentation told a different story. Seen running for the first time on final hardware, these games looked about the same as the Xbox 360's catalogue. 
hardly the best advertisement for the cell processor. And there's a reason they looked underwhelming. Brace yourself, I'm afraid we need to talk about machine architecture. The architecture of the Xbox 360 was similar to what you'd find in a desktop PC today. Some memory, some storage, a GPU, and a triple core CPU. A developer who'd written for the PC before could jump platforms with relative ease. But the PlayStation 3's architecture was less conventional. Its cell processor contained only one main core, called the power processor element, a core very similar to the three power PC cores found in the Xbox 360. Surrounding the PPE, figuratively speaking, were seven synergistic processing elements. Programmable coprocessors optimized for high performance number crunching. On paper, Sony's architecture was the more powerful of the two. At full load, the PS3 could perform double the operations per second of the Xbox 360. And for certain types of scientific and specialized applications, it was lightning fast. But here's the catch. The PPE on its own wasn't that powerful. To make the most of the machine, a program's code had to fully utilize the SPEs as well. But this was a headache for game developers. Because the cell processor wasn't designed just for gaming. To spread the high cost of R&D, Sony had planned for the cell to power all of their consumer electronics devices. To break even, they estimated they would need to put three cells in every household. Not just in the PS3, but in televisions, media players, cameras. They designed a processor that could power all of these devices. One that was versatile, but troublesome. Here's Gabe Newell with an example. So one of my junior programmers who's writing game code rather than system code could slow things down by, in a real world case, by a factor of 80 because they're doing something out in the AI or in the game DLL which used to be totally safe and now all of a sudden the whole system just slows down and then one of the real experienced programmers have to go in and say, oh, you can't tell but you're doing this, you ran out of registry space and this other thing happened and no, there's no debugger that shows this to you. Newell wasn't the only developer with complaints. Many expressed their frustrations with development on the PS3. Kazunori Yamauchi would later describe developing the two PS3 installments of Gran Turismo as a nightmare. In fact, according to Michiel van der Leeuw, the technical director of the Killzone series, early in the PS3's life, many games didn't even touch the SPEs, putting them at a serious performance disadvantage. This explains why early in its cycle, the PS3 versions of most multi-platform titles ran at lower resolutions and lower detail levels than the 360. Unlocking the PS3's potential took expert knowledge that most studios simply lacked and that Sony couldn't be relied upon to provide. Kase Rai claimed that the complexity of working with the cell was deliberate, so that developers would tap into its full potential slowly over the lifespan of the platform. And perhaps that's true, but I suspect this rationalization came afterwards. But whether by design or not, this really was the effect of the PS3's complex architecture. Between 2007 and 2013, as Naughty Dog wrung more and more power out of the hardware, the games went from this to this. The machine's architecture also led to early bottlenecks in manufacturing. The blue laser diodes used in the optical drive were in short supply, and yields on the cell processor were very low, only 10-20% to 20 according to a VP of Intel at the time. These production difficulties and other delays led to the console's Spring 2006 ship date being delayed to November. In Europe, release was delayed a second time to March 2007, forfeiting Sony's pledge of a simultaneous global release. Simultaneously throughout the world, in major territories, this November. Developer frustration and production difficulties, byproducts of Ken Kutaragi's complex design, but there was a third, even worse downside, and it would all but obliterate the PS3's prospects at launch. Sony's aggressive stance on console pricing had played a big role in their success. Eleven years earlier, at the first E3, Sony's confident announcement of the price of the original PlayStation, undercutting the just-announced Sega Saturn by $100, was a mic drop moment. $299. Five years after that, the PS2 released at the same $299 price. 
and in 2013, the PS4 launched at $399. Adjusting for 18 years of inflation, that's basically the same price as the PS1. But the two PS3 models were announced at $499 and $599 US dollars, well ahead of the otherwise largely indistinguishable Xbox 360. The same price gap was evident in Japan and Europe. In the room, the announcement was greeted with shock. Almost everyone was in agreement. Sony's pricing was far too expensive. But they may not have had much choice. In an IGN interview after his retirement, Sony's Jack Tretton claimed that even at that price, Sony was still losing money on each unit. It was extremely expensive to manufacture, so at the price it came out at, everybody knew that wasn't a consumer-friendly price. And amazingly, that was losing a lot of money for Sony even at that price. So, wow. Analysts estimated the console's cost to Sony at over $800. Kutaragi and his team had designed a machine that could not be produced on the cheap, and low yields drove the price up even further. But one group couldn't have been happier. So we're watching on some feed, I don't even yeah, know what whatever. feed it was, but it was really bad and we couldn't tell. God bless Kasserai and Jack Trenton announced $599 and we were all backstage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the room we were in went silent. And, and I said, did he really say what I think he said? We knew their product, their, their bill of materials was gonna be too expensive, but we thought they'd suck it up. We knew then we had the opportunity to get ahead, drive ahead, get our games out quickly. I said absolutely in my mind, and many of us said out loud, oh, this, this could be really fun. After the presentation was over. A new era for Sony Computer Entertainment begins with PlayStation 3 now. A final indignity. To the shock of Sony execs, most attendees headed straight for the exits, not noticing, or ignoring, the banks of playable PS3s to the sides. Undecided gamers now had the information they needed to make up their minds. Buy an Xbox now, or wait six months to spend more money on a machine with a smaller library. Predictably, many chose the 360, leading to a new sales record for the machine in the quarter after E3. Throughout the summer, a common refrain was that you could buy a 360 and a Wii for the same price as a PS3. And though it turned out when Nintendo announced the price in September that the sums in this meme didn't add up, the point still resonated. PS3 equals expensive. It wasn't until the launch of the stripped-down Slim model that Sony were able to bring down the price to $299. And it wasn't until four years after that, in 2013, that Sony started selling more consoles each month than Microsoft. Over the lifespan of the machine, Sony would catch up, selling slightly more units in total than the Xbox 360, an impressive comeback from a self-inflicted wound. The PS3 was a strategic move by Kutaragi and the company, a Trojan horse to get Blu-ray and the cell processor into homes. With Blu-ray at work, the competing format was routed, but their other plan utterly failed. They never made a second cell-powered device. Sony, IBM, and Toshiba's big investment in the future of silicon had ultimately not paid off. The line between a great presentation and a disaster is a fine one, and I'm sure that pulling off a smooth event is a hundred times harder than it looks. Sony had hardware they were proud of with plenty of playable demo consoles, and a solid software lineup with some heavy-hitting exclusives. And whatever the internet might say, Kaz Hirai is a charismatic enough presenter. They probably thought their presentation would be a hit, but a few clumsy moments and some awkward pacing later, and the result became a literal joke. It's still used as a punchline today, as if it's the worst presentation ever seen at E3, which it certainly isn't. But imagine for a moment the alternate universe in which Sony gave the best possible show at E3, that rather than leaving it until the end, they got the price out of the way early, then hit the audience with a perfectly paced showcase of demos and announcements building up to a final crescendo, the reveal, held back until this moment, of Metal Gear Solid 4. What would have happened? A perfect keynote might have avoided a lot of internet ridicule, but I don't think it would have otherwise made much difference. They would still have had a machine that was difficult to produce at scale and awkward to develop for. They'd still have had release delays, and the production costs would still have been sky high, necessitating a price that consumers couldn't justify, all for a console which, in practice, was less impressive than its more compelling, more affordable, and already available cousin. All of these problems arose from decisions taken years earlier, 
and it's those factors, not giant enemy crabs, that condemned them to third place for years. Sony's E3 wasn't the cause of the PS3's failure at launch. It was a symptom of a company that was already past the point of no return, though perhaps too overconfident to recognize it. Before 2006 was out, Kaz Hirai was promoted to president of Sony Computer Entertainment, and within six years was appointed CEO of the entire corporation. He's been credited with successfully turning the company around and bringing it back to profitability. Phil Harrison resigned from Sony in 2008, and after a stint at Omphagram slash Atari, joined his old rival Microsoft to head their European Xbox division. He's now a vice president at Google, where he's rumored to be working on a game streaming service, codenamed Yeti. Ken Kutaragi was given a promotion to an honorary role in 2007. Many interpreted this as a face-saving way to demote him from future projects, a chastisement for the failure of the cell. For designing a sophisticated machine, while losing sight of the fact that the company would need to manufacture it, developers would need to work with it, and consumers would need to pay for it, but this version of events might not be true. Former SCE chairman Shigeo Mariyama recently told Polygon that even before the PS3 shipped, Kutaragi didn't expect to be involved in the next PlayStation. So perhaps he stepped aside on his own. At any rate, the man known as Crazy Ken left his honorary position and the company a few years later. The PS4, designed by a team led by Mark Cerny, was the first PlayStation to feature no input from Kutaragi. Its number one design priority was simplicity. Bob, you can get an Xbox system for something like $250, can't you? Isn't $500 on, an awful lot for a game system? At the big unveiling last night, Sony tried to promote all the advantages that it's putting into the PlayStation 3, but, but even some gaming industry writers at that news conference were already calling it expensive. One labeled it outrageously expensive. Sony was forced to postpone the launch of its new PlayStation 3. The game's console won't now go on sale here until March. The man who has been called the father of the PlayStation is leaving his post at Sony. The change comes at a difficult time for PlayStation's electronic grandson. I totally see why Sony wants people to write code that runs on seven SPEs and a central processing unit. Because that code's never going to run well anywhere else. Thank you, Jack. How about that tie he's wearing? Can you... I can't believe Cos made fun of my tie. I was tempted to bust out that Ridge Racer line, but I like my job too much, so... Wow. Thanks for watching.